George Norman Douglas was a British writer. He was born in 1868 in the municipality of Thuringen in Austria, the son of a cotton mill manager named John Schoto Douglas and of Wanda von Pelnitz. He was raised at Tilkuhili, Scotland, and studied first at Uppingham School and then at the Karlsruhe Gymnasium. He served in the diplomatic service between 1894 and 1896, being forced to leave due to an undisclosed sexual scandal. In 1898, he married his cousin Elizabeth Louisa Theobaldina Fitzgibbon, but the couple divorced in 1903, supposedly due to Elizabeth's infidelity. He spent the next several years living first in London and then on the island of Capri, working on the English Review between 1912 and 1914. In 1916, he was due to be arrested on charge of indecent assault of a 16-year-old boy, skipping bail and leaving the country to avoid the fallout. D. H. Lawrence, a former associate of Douglas's and noted writer, described the event as kissing a boy and giving him some cakes and a shilling. Douglas then lived in Florence, publishing his books through Pino Orioli, publisher and bookseller who specialised in publishing works that would be prosecuted for obscenity elsewhere, including another work of D. H. Lawrence's. Afterwards, he moved to France, but in 1940 he returned to London. He spent the last five years of his life on the island of Capri, dying in 1952, supposedly from an intentional overdose after suffering a long illness. His last words are reported to have been, Get those fucking nuns away from me. In the Beginning was first published in 1927 in Florence. The story takes place in a quasi-fantastical world, focusing mainly on a primitive tribalistic society where gods and spirits abound and usually make things more difficult for people just for the hell of it. The novel begins with the maiden Aira meeting her best friend Linus close by her father's hut. He is suddenly startled by a vision he sees in the distance, witnessing the sight of a distant mountainside and a figure of a man in the sky. He goes to ask his aged uncle to see what this may mean, but the old man says it doesn't mean anything while howling in pain from the ache he attributes to an egg demon, bemoaning how the gods have nothing much better to do than kill and torture humans for fun. Such as the Earth God, who loves nothing better than to go to the land of the Colossinthians and wreck all their palaces and temples they had laboriously rebuilt after the last time he had wrecked everything. That is, when he and his other fellow gods aren't busy making fun of the moon for being impotent and having epileptic fits. After the death of Linus's aged grandmother, he travels to seek the guidance of Nahuni, the last of the satyr race, a mighty race who built great monuments in their day and who held greater wisdom than men anywhere in the world ever could. Linus seeks the satyr's instruction to gain wisdom and Nahuni obliges, complaining all the while about men, the gods, the weather and most other things under the sun. After a few days, Linus is suddenly sought out by Durko, great maiden goddess of the city of Eskion, for the purpose of satisfying her very urgent needs with something a bit different from incense and litanies. And then it turns out, due to Linus's divine parentage of which he himself is ignorant, that the proud Durko is now with child, something unthinkable to such a maidenly goddess. Nea Huni refuses to help her when she seeks him out, so Durko goes to kill Linus and then she slowly burns Ira and her father to death for good measure, all because Linus had dared to bed and then impregnate Ira after having had intercourse with a goddess. Sadly, the story gets far less interesting from here on out. The author at this point decides to have the Earth God come and make Linus come back to life with a new personality, as well as no remembrance of his life until his death, with the whole of Linus's village being completely forgotten and abandoned story-wise. Suddenly all the personal stuff we had learned about the protagonist stops being important and we delve into a more distant, less interesting story about his conquests, all of them of the romantic kind. The story stops being interested in details and only ever bothers to tell us about Linus's sexual appetite, which is the only thing he even does that gets any focus until he just up and dies, after which the story still keeps going a while for some reason, only ending a short while after the death of his wife. Overall, the latter half of the story is more distant and detached, with few details and incidents really worth noting. I mean, I could describe how Linus and his wife go out and create a large empire through conquest, but the author is not really interested in actually doing anything with this and simply tells you about it in a very bored manner, so why should I? This coming after Douglas established a world full of meddling gods and troublesome demons about which he suddenly stops caring about for no real reason.
which is all rather a shame as this book initially started out as a very Eric Linklater-esque fantasy.